Well, today we wrap up our series, You Asked For It. If you remember several weeks ago, even months ago, I I sent out a survey to all of you and asked you to select some topics that you wanted to hear about, and today we we finish our time with that. If you missed uh, any of them, they can be found on our website, and I want to encourage you to go back and listen to some of them. Uh, But today we wrap up the series with a message on sharing our faith, and I just want to say once again that, that I'm really proud of you for selecting that as one of your top four. Uh, you know, this is a topic that is important to us today, important to the church to share our faith, and, uh, and it's one that I hope that I can tackle for you today in maybe a fresh way, in a new way, and maybe even give you some practical things that you can use even this week. Uh, I just want to briefly mention that next week I'll be starting a new series called This Is Us. Anybody see that TV show? Anybody watch that? Okay. Uh, it's a TV show. That's where I got the name, but we're going to be focused not on the TV show. We're going to be focused on relationships. And, uh, and so I just want to encourage you to be here. It'll be a four-week series on relationships. We'll talk about parenting relationships. We'll talk about friendships. We'll talk about coworkers and bosses. We'll talk about husbands and wives. And so it's going to be a great series. So I hope you'll make plans to be here for that uh, throughout the rest of our time in October. And I just want to remind you that the last Sunday of October is a fifth Sunday. And so that means that we will have no child care that day. We call that a family Sunday. And so all of our children, children will be in here worshiping with us. We think that's important to our church for our children to see what we do uh, because what happens is kids get out of uh, kids' ministry, and they don't know what church is like, and so they tune out, and so this is a way to give them a glimpse of that, help them to uh, be acclimated to that, and so that's an important day of ministry for us. So just I'll remind you of that in the coming weeks for sure. Well, like I said, sharing our faith, it's, it's important to the Christian faith, isn't it? Yes. Yes, Pastor Tim, it is. Why? Well, because it's a mandate, It is a mandate that we share our faith. It is not optional. It is not something that is for somebody else. It is not just for the pastor. It is a mandate for all of us as the church. We all have an obligation to share our faith. I thought about ending the sermon there, but maybe I'll continue. (laughs) There's no confusion around it. Last week's message, there was confusion around spiritual gifts. This topic... There's absolutely no confusion around it. It is a mandate. Jesus himself directs us to do that. We see in Mark chapter 16, Jesus said to his followers, go everywhere. Not just your neighborhood, not just your city, but everywhere. Go everywhere in the world, because I love the whole world, but go everywhere in the whole world and tell the what? The good news to everyone. The good news to everyone. And you know, one of the things that we believe here at the Journey Church is that we're not just a church for church people. I'll say that again. We're not just a church for church people. It's okay. You don't have to speak back to me today. There's going to be a lot more challenging stuff I'm going to say, so you better get them in now before you, before you don't want to. We don't, we don't do everything that we do on a Sunday morning or through the week simply or just for church people. We don't, we don't just do that. That's not, that's not our only focus. And listen, if you're here today, I would say that you're in one of two places. One place that you might find yourself in today is that you're on a journey to meet God. Your goal right now is to just find him, to just learn more about him, and, and hopefully, my hope is that you'll end up having a relationship with him. But once you find him, this would be the other category that I'm sure many of you are in, is that you move then to where you're a part of the team. You then are a part of the family. You then are on the search committee. You are then a part of the group of people that has a mandate, a responsibility to reach out to the lost around us and all over the world. And one of the things that's that's most important for us to understand is that God is very interested in the kids of his, his kids that are lost. God is supremely interested in those that aren't found. In fact, I would say that God is most interested in his kids that are lost. I mean, if you've ever lost one of your kids, you know what I'm talking about. I'm not going to confirm or deny if that's ever happened to me. But if you've lost your kid, even for a moment, 
it can be a scary thing, can it? And when you lose something of value to you, you never take inventory of the found things. When one of my kids runs away from me and I lose them in the grocery store, I'm not saying that happened, but when, when it happens, I don't look at my other three kids and say, well, I've got 75%, so that's good. <laughs> Although, on the day, it depends on which kid it is that ran away. <laughs> I'm kidding, don't tell them that. There were some moans, I think, from over there. When you, when you lose your keys, you don't say, well, at least I have my wallet. You don't, you don't say those things. You're distracted by the thing that you've lost. And I would say that God is distracted by the thing that is lost. His kids that are lost. When we are worshiping him here on a Sunday morning, he's looking at us and he's saying, yeah, good job. But he's also continually looking around for his lost kids. His eyes are on them always. His word actually says that he would actually leave 99 found people to go find the one that is lost. He loves the lost. And because we love God, we love the things that he loves. And because he loves the lost, we love the lost. It's just how it works. We love the lost. And listen, I could fill up your entire note outline. Hopefully you have one. You can pull it out now. I could have filled that up with scriptures about this topic all day long, both sides. I could have filled it out. But there's one scripture that I want to point you to that I think puts it the best. It's found in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And it says, we, we are Christ's ambassadors. I love that word, ambassadors. We're here to represent him. In other words, the only Jesus that other people get to see is us. We are the Jesus that people get to see. We are his ambassadors. And then he said God is making his appeal to them through who? Through us. He is making his appeal through us. In other words, God doesn't have a plan B. There's no other way. We're it. We are his plan. And it's important. And you know that. That's why you ask for it. That's why we're talking about it today. You know that this topic, sharing our faith, reaching the lost, is an important one. And as important as it is, we all must also recognize that it's just not that easy anymore, is it? I would imagine that's largely why you asked about it. It's not easy to share our faith in an increasingly skeptical world, is it? Or those that, those that are adamantly against religion or Christianity or Christian things. It can be difficult to navigate those waters to share our faith effectively. Or people that have presuppositions or ideas about faith that simply aren't true. It's tough. It is simply not easy anymore. But even with that truth, God doesn't let us off the hook, does he? He doesn't say, I know it's tough, it's okay, take today off. No, he challenges us. He tells us, do it anyway. Do it anyway. Because it's important. It's important that we share our faith. And it's important now more than ever that we share our faith. And I'm so proud of you for asking this question. Because I want our church, and I bet you want our church, to be one that's comfortable with sharing our faith. We want to be a church that's okay sharing our faith with others. But listen, as I get started here, I just want to say I have a bone to pick. Sometimes I get up on my soapbox, you know that. I often apologize for it. Maybe I shouldn't apologize for it. But today's going to be one of those days. Just allow me for just a moment to get on my soapbox. And I just want to say I appreciate you for allowing me to speak about things that really bother me as your pastor. But I think by and large, Christianity has gotten this wrong. I think that sharing our faith, we've gotten wrong for far too long. I think that what we've seen is two extremes of sharing our faith. And both worry me. The first is that we've ended up with people in church or pastors that say, let's be as secular as the world. 
We can't beat them, so let's just join them. This is the days we live in. Let's be more inclusive. Let's change the Bible to fit culture. Let's water down what we believe. Listen, you can't make a difference unless you're different. Period. You cannot make a difference unless you're different. You don't have to compromise to make a difference. But then there's the other extreme. There's the other extreme of Christians that are so dogmatic, so legalistic about their beliefs that they make it so darn unattractive to be a Christian. They make people say, well, if, if being a Christian means that, I don't want any part of it. In fact, if you're going to be like that, I don't even want to be around you. Two very real extremes And both are wrong. And so, the big question for all of us is how are we at that? How are we at being attractive without compromising? And listen, I think it can be done. I think it can be done. Matter of fact, I know it can be done. I think we can be attractive as a church, as a Christian, as a body of believers without compromising what is true about our faith. I think we can do it. And I love this verse. It's our verse for today. Highlight it, circle it, remember it, memorize it. It comes from Colossians chapter 4. It says, be wise. Say, be wise. Don't be loud. Be wise. Don't be silent. Be wise. Don't even be right. Be wise. Be wise. The goal isn't to be right. It's to be effective. Effective. Be wise in the way you act toward outsiders. When you're with them, in other words, you are the representation of Jesus himself. It continues, make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be what? Full of grace. I love this. Seasoned with salt. Make it palatable for people. Make it taste good. Seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. I love this. I love this. This scripture is so good. And I just want to give this to you in plain, simple English so that you can begin to apply it even this week. I want to make it as easy as possible to you and for you. In fact, we try to do this as a church. We try to make the things we believe as attractive as we can. Why? Well, First Peter gives us insight into why we do that. It says to always be prepared. Be ready. Be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you. And I think that's important if we pause there. Uh, we don't have the scripture up, but always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you. In other words, there's an assumption that people will ask you. In other words, there's an assumption that your life is going to be attractive enough that they're going to want to ask you about it. But we should be prepared to give an answer for the hope that we have. People ask us, why why do you go to church on Sunday? Why are you in that small group? Why do you serve like you do? Why do you pray? Why doesn't the chaos going on in the world get you all fired up? Why don't you grieve like me? What is the reason for your hope? What is the reason for the hope that you obviously have? Is your hope obvious to those around you? Or is it buried beneath a layer of fear, hate, selfishness, and pride? It's a tough question, but it's worth evaluating. And listen, I want to help you with this. I want to give you three simple things that you can begin doing right away. Then at the end of the message, I kind of want to pivot, and I want to help you understand some of the biggest disconnects that people have that are outside of the faith. And so we're going to unpack these things together. But very simply, if you're going to be people, and if we're going to be a church that reaches lost people, the people that Jesus cares about so much, then we've got to do it in the way that Jesus did it. Is that amen worthy?
I think it is. I think it is. And so this whole outline I'm about to give you comes from the life of Jesus and how he did it. So here's the first one. You can fill it in on your outline. It's to connect with people. It's to connect with people. You've got to connect before you correct people. I knew that wouldn't garner an amen except for for my wife. You've got to connect before you correct. A lot of people want to correct before they have the relationship with somebody. They won't receive it. Listen, Jesus, he was the great connector. He connected better than anybody. And what is so genius about his life is that he never compromised truth in order to do it. But sinners, sinners loved to be around him, didn't they? They loved to just sit around his feet and listen to him. And it wasn't because he said, ah, it's okay, live however you want to. He never said that. He corrected them. He never compromised truth. But he also didn't correct before he had the connection. People don't care about what you know. They just want to know that you care. And that's why I refuse to bring you a message today on this topic that simply informs you more. Informs you so you can win the argument. Listen, you can win the argument and still lose. And we don't want to be right. We want to be effective. Right is not our primary focus. We want to be effective. And so how is your effectiveness? The simple way to be effective is to connect first. That's why we have, that's why you have a food pantry. That's why we do it. That's why we have a food pantry, so that we can meet the needs of people in our community. So that we can love on people and so that we can serve them. And listen, it's not just to meet people's very real need, but also so that we can earn their respect. It's why we do outreaches like Hullabaloo on Halloween. Regardless of your view of Halloween, whether it should be celebrated or not, this is a prime time where people will be open to what we have to say, but we can go and serve them and love them. It's why we do it, so we can connect with people. Why? Why do we do that? Why do we have a food pantry? Why do we do outreach events? So that when these people find themselves at a point of crisis, we are the first people they think of. When they find themselves in need, and not just in physical need, but in spiritual need, that the journey church will be first on their minds. The Bible, it talks time and time again about sowing seeds, doesn't it? We tend to be focused on immediate results. It's our culture. It's our generation. Immediate gratification. But listen, the Bible's clear about sowing seeds. Sowing seeds. It takes time. It takes watering. It takes fertilizing. It takes all of the stuff to make them grow. And I believe that's what we're doing through these outreach events. That's what we're doing through our food pantry and a host of other ministries. And I believe that in due time, we will reap a harvest. We will reap a harvest. Why? Because we connected with people. We served people. We love people. In fact, I want to be known in our city, in our community, in our county, as a church that helps people and serves people. I don't want to be a church that's known for everything we're against. I want to be a church that's known for what we're for. And we're for the lost. We're for the hurting. We're for the least of these. And listen, when you love people in that way, it opens the door for them to hear from you. I want to show you a verse that you probably know where Jesus defines his entire mission for us. All in one sentence. Luke chapter 19 verse 10. It says, for the Son of Man, Jesus, came to seek and to save what was lost. If we're going to be a church that's like Jesus, then we need to be doing this. This is why we do what we do. But we know verse 10, I want to back up. I want to back up and look at the verses that lead up to Jesus saying this. Let's go back to verse Number one in Luke 19, it says, Jesus entered Jericho 
and was passing through. And a man there by the name of Zacchaeus, he was a chief tax collector. Now let me bring that into modern day terms for you. Tax collector, he, he was someone that nobody liked. He was a thief. He was a sleazy politician. He was somebody that nobody really wanted to be around. He was a chief tax collector. And he was wealthy. And he wanted to see who Jesus was. Now notice it doesn't say he wanted to see what Jesus knew. He wanted to see who Jesus was. They don't want to know what you know. They want to know who you are. But because he was short, don't, no commentary on me, but because he was short, he couldn't see over the crowd. And so he ran ahead and he climbed a sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see. Anybody know that song? No. Yeah. <laughs> Since Jesus was coming that way. That's the most singing you will ever get from me. <laughs> when Jesus reached the spot, he looked up to him. And he said, Zacchaeus, you thief, you need to get saved. You need to change everything around you and about you. No, he didn't say that. He didn't at all say that. He said, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I want to go to your house. I want to have lunch. I want to see where you live. I want to see where you do life. I want to be with you. I want to, I want to connect with you. And so he came down at once and he welcomed him gladly. And listen, people will welcome you gladly too if that's your response. If your response is that you want to get to know them, if you want to connect with them, they will welcome you gladly too. But if you point your finger at them and you tell them they need to get saved and they need to change this and they need to change that, of course they're going to shut you out of their life. All the people saw this. All the people, the religious people, saw this and began to mutter. Don't you love that word? Mutter. Find a way to use that in your week this week, mutter. They all began to mutter. He has gone to be the guest of a sinner. How dare he? And listen, people are going to criticize us. People are going to criticize me. They're going to criticize our church. My prayer is that the only thing they find to criticize us about is that we like to be around sinners. But Zacchaeus stood up. Now, what has happened at this moment there's been some time pass. So, you know, the writer here, he wasn't invited to the lunch. We don't know the details. We don't know what they had to eat. We don't know what they discussed. But all of a sudden, there's this gap in time where they go from meeting to now they're done eating. And he's standing up from the table, Zacchaeus is. And he said to the Lord, look, Lord, here and now, I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount Wow, what did they have to eat? What did they talk about? What was said at that lunch? I have no idea. But it must have been life-changing. And Jesus says to him, today, Zacchaeus, you have figured out what Christianity is all about. Salvation has come to this house. Because this man, too, is a son of Abraham. And then we see our verse, don't we? Because the Son of Man came. To connect before he corrects, to have lunch with people, to get to know people, to seek and to save the lost. All we have to do, church, is to care for people. We have to love people. We have to add value to people. That's what we have to do. We have to connect, connect with them. Here's number two. Here's the second thing. In sharing our faith. The second thing after you've connected with them is to share your story with people. Share your story with people. Listen, you all have a story, whether you recognize it or not. And the best evangelism tip I can give you, write this down, write this down. This is the best thing you're going to get all day from this sermon. The best evangelism tip I can give you is to not go around and tell people how they need to change. Don't do it. Don't go around and tell people how to change. In fact, there's absolutely no verse in the Bible that says our mission is to go around and point out where everyone's wrong and then highlight it for them. There's nothing there. The Bible just simply does not say that. In fact, it says the very opposite, and so many of us need to get this. It says in Matthew 5, 16, let 
your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Notice what happens here in this verse. Is that when your light shines because of your good deeds, because of what you're doing, because of how you're living, then listen, your life becomes attractive. Not perfect, but attractive. And then what will happen in turn is that they will want your God. They will want to know more about your Father. They see you and what you do and hear who you are, and then they want to hear your story. And they begin to think to themselves, I want that God. I need that in my life. Because you look different. Because you look different to them. That's why we need to do what it says in Acts chapter 1. You will be my witnesses. It's where we got the word witness, right? Witness to people. This is where we get it from. You will be my witnesses. Now listen, witnesses, it's been misconstrued over the years. Let me, let me clarify a little bit for you. If you go into the courthouse, you go into the court, anybody, no, I'm not gonna ask. Uh, if you go into a courthouse, you will see a judge. Don't be the judge. You will see a prosecutor. Don't prosecute. You will see the defender. He doesn't need us to defend him. And then you have the witnesses. And that's us. That's us. We just need to go and tell our story. We need to tell others the difference that Jesus has made in our lives. Be witnesses to what Jesus has done, telling people about me or about him everywhere. We should always be prepared to give an answer for the hope that we have. And the best way to do that is to simply tell your story. We all have that story. And listen, I would encourage you to practice your story. Somehow we think that that's unspiritual, but listen, practice your story. Get it down. Get it down to a two-minute version. Say something like, when the opportunity presents itself, let me tell you something about myself that you may not know. And then tell them your story. Tell them your story. Here's mine. I was raised in church. I thought that that was what it meant to be a Christian, to go to a building and to practice religion. Sing songs, listen to a sermon, say a few amens, and go back home and watch football. Then I came to a church like this one, where I saw people worshiping God, where I saw people having a real relationship with him. And it shocked me, and it interested me all at the same time. And I was at the point of crisis in my life. And I found myself by myself saying to God, I choose you today and forever. And I had a face-to-face encounter with Jesus Christ. And it dramatically changed my life. That's the moment that I discovered that it wasn't about where I was that made me a Christian, but it was about who I knew. Now, I tell as many people that, as I can that Christianity isn't about a church building. It's about a person. It's about a relationship. If you join the church, fine, but that's not what it's about. Jesus changed my life. And that's my story. And you have a story. You have one, too. And if you can share it in a way that's attractive for other people, it will compel them to want to know more about what you have, and more about the God that you know. And that will lead us to our third one. The third one is to invite them. Connect with them, share your story, and then invite them to a place where they can experience God. I would love to see us get away from calling this meeting together our Sunday mornings as a service. I would much rather us call them an experience because Sunday morning is not just something you attend, it's something that you encounter. In fact, Jesus isn't a religion, he's a person. He's not someone to be understood, he's someone to be encountered. He's someone that if you have a face-to-face, authentic encounter with him, you will never be a skeptic again. And listen, I know there's probably skeptics here today, and that's okay. I don't even blame you. It's okay to be a skeptic. The church as a whole has not done a good job of showing you who he is. But our goal here at the Journey Church is to help you have an experience with him that is undeniable. 
Listen, people don't need more church. They don't need more church. They need to experience the person of Jesus. Paul, the writer of more than half of the New Testament, he was a skeptic. In fact, he found himself killing Christians. He was a trained religious man called a Pharisee. He was a skeptic and he was killing Christians. And until he met Jesus face to face, he remained a skeptic. But once he met Jesus, everything changed. He didn't get an explanation. He had an encounter. Here's what he says about it in 1 Corinthians. He says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, you'll remember, friends, that when I first came to you to let you in on God's master stroke, I didn't try to impress you. I didn't try to impress you with polished speeches and the latest philosophy because those ways aren't ways that people are going to accept Jesus anyway. I deliberately kept it plain and simple. First, Jesus and who he is, then Jesus and what he did. You need to know him, and you need to know what he can do for your life. Jesus crucified. I was unsure of how to go about this. Maybe you feel that way today. Maybe that's why you put this down as one of your top you asked for it choices and felt totally inadequate. I can relate to that. I was scared to death if you want to know the truth of it. And so nothing I said could have impressed you or anyone else. But the message came through anyway. God's spirit and God's power did it, which made it clear that your life of faith is a response to God's power, not to some fancy mental or emotional footwork by me or someone else. Let that be said of all of us. And that's why I encourage you, don't do it. Don't try to engage people with information or all all the ways that they're wrong. Invite them to a place. Invite them somewhere where they can experience Jesus. And you know, if you're here today, can I just say, you don't have to do anything today. You don't have to sing, you don't have to give, you don't have to serve. I just want you to experience Jesus today. Just experience him. Have you been there before? Have you been at the point where you've experienced Jesus I know I have. I would say that I experienced a point in my life where I was literally tormented. And I remember being in church services where I felt the presence and the peace of God. Have you ever had that? Pills don't do it. Alcohol won't do it. The pleasures of life sure won't do it. When I walk into the church service... It's an experience that brings with it calm and peace unlike anything else I've experienced before. And I can't explain it. And the truth is, it it doesn't need explanation, does it? It's the peace and the presence and the power of God. And as much as it doesn't need explanation for me, it doesn't need explanation for your friends and your family and your coworkers either. What they need to know is that you love them like Jesus loves them. Let's care for people. Let's serve people. Let's meet people's practical needs. Let's do whatever we can do to show the love of God to them. Let's then look for opportunities to tell them our story. Not everything that's wrong with them or everything they need to change about themselves, but look for opportunities to tell them our story and the difference that Jesus has made for us in our lives. And then, when it's appropriate, Get them to a place where they can experience him. In fact, that series I'm starting next week, This Is Us, it's a perfect series to invite somebody to. Relationships, we all have them. We all need to get better at them. We all have people that aggravate us. We all have relationships in our lives that we need to, we need to muddle through and get through and figure out a better way to do it. That's what I'm gonna be talking about. Invite friends to that. Man, what a great time to do that and help them find a place where they can experience God. Now, with all of that being said, with all of those three steps that we can all begin to implement this week to share our faith, let me share with you the real reason why people say no. I think it's because they have wrong information. 
I think the biggest reason why people say no to the things of faith is because they have wrong information. Because listen, you know this, I know this, that anybody in their right minds who knows what we know wouldn't say no to it, would they? And the truth is, is that they have bad pictures. It's like the kid that says, I don't want to play basketball because I don't like being tackled and that helmet's just too heavy. Oh, uh, that's football. Oh, okay, I'll play basketball then. It's wrong thinking. It's misinformed thinking. And it's why it's very important that we clear this up. We've got to clear up these wrong pictures of God. And Jesus, he had to deal with this with his own disciples. Mark chapter 8, Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. On the way, he asked them, who do people say that I am? They replied, some say John the Baptist. You know, he was beheaded, and you're John the Baptist incarnate. Others say Elijah. Others say the prophets. But what about you? Jesus asked them, who do you say that I am? Peter answered, you are the Christ. And listen, if people can experience the Christ, if they can experience him, they'll be set free. They'll be free. But there's so many wrong views of that Christians have, or that non-Christians have about God, and I want to share with you just a few of them. The first is this view of a locked gate. You can write that down on your outline, a locked gate. People have this view of God kind of like he's Chick-fil-A on Sundays. Like you can drive up to the door, you can look through the window, but you can't get in. They're closed. If you didn't know, Chick-fil-A's closed on Sunday. You have to know that to get that. It's there. God is there, but you just can't get in. You may hear me say on a Sunday morning, you know, if you're a Christian and you're far from God, that's not even a theologically correct statement. If you're a Christian, you can't be far from God. God is near if you're a Christian. But sometimes that's how people feel. They feel like God is somehow far from them. He's, he's, he's real, but he seems so far away. And this is the myth, is that God can't be reached. That God can't be reached. And here's the good news. The good news is that God isn't far away. No matter where you find yourself, listen, no matter where you find yourself today, God is near. God is near. In fact, in Acts, I love the way the message puts it. It says he doesn't play hide and seek with us. He's not remote. He's near. Listen, he's here today. I can introduce you to him today. He is here. He's not far away from us. He is near. That's the first wrong thinking that many people have. Here's the second one, the second lens that people see God through, and it's the lens of a pile of luggage. They think, man, if I could just get rid of all the baggage, then, then, I, can, then I can go to church. Or if I can just get rid of all the bad stuff from my past first, then I can go to church. I mean, I'm such a bad person. If, if I could just be a good person, even for just a week, then I can go to church. If I could just get rid of all of that, then I can have a relationship with God. I know, I know he came to help those people, but I need to get cleaned up first. This is the thinking that I know God forgives me, but I can't forgive myself. It's the myth that God doesn't want me. And the truth is, is that he has more compassion, and I'd like to think maybe even more love for those who need him the most. God loves you. Hear this today. He loves you. And he wants to have a relationship with you. Desperately. Romans 5, 8. But God showed us his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us. When? While we were still sinners. While they're still sinning, yeah, I'll go ahead and pay for that. While you're still wrapped up in it, yeah, I'll pay for that too. You don't have to get cleaned up first. Why? Why? To show his great love for us. And listen, church, can I just say we've messed this one up? We've communicated the message that you've got to get yourself cleaned up. You've got to get rid of all that baggage before God will love you and accept you. We say, oh, you're gay. No, 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 you need to get that cleaned up before you come to my church. You're an alcoholic. No, you need to fix that first, and then you can come to church. You're a Democrat. Oh, no, you've got to change that before you come to my church. 
You don't like donuts? No, you better definitely clean that one up before you come to my church. It's the loudest statement I've gotten all day. Thank you. But you can fill in the blank for yourself. You're a blank. Fix that first and then come to church. That's wrong thinking, guys. Church, that is wrong thinking. He tells us that he died for all of us, all of us when we were sinners. Every last one of us. And there is none of us, no person that is too far from the reach of God. No one. And until we grab a hold of that, we will be known as a church for what we're against rather than what we're for. Here's another one. It's the lens that says you can get there, but it's going to take some work. It's the lens of an endless ladder. It's the idea of works. You've got to do stuff before God will love you. You've got to do stuff before God will accept you. It's the myth that God requires a lot from me. God, uh, Jesus himself clarifies this in John chapter 6. Then they ask him, what must we do to do the works of God that he requires? And Jesus answered, the work of God is this, to believe. That's it, to believe. That's all it takes, to believe. To believe, that's it. People say, yeah, well, I've read verses that say works without faith is dead. Yeah, that's for after you're saved. That's after you've accepted Christ. That's for me and you that have a relationship with Jesus. After you begin the relationship with him. It's not how you get saved. That's after you get saved. Now, God, hear me. He wants us to do works around here. If you're a Christian, he's got stuff that he wants to get done but it's not so he can love us or accept us anymore. Listen, I don't mow my grass so Consuela will love me more. I mow the grass because it's tall. It needs to be done. I'm sorry, honey, that I haven't mowed the grass recently. God's got stuff he needs to have done. And he does it through you and me. I think that's pretty cool. I think it's awesome that he does that through us. But there's a a fourth lens, and I want to invite the worship team to go ahead and come back up. And it's the lens of the free gift. It's the free gift. Listen, God, he, he wants to give you something that you don't deserve. Aren't those the best kind of gifts? The gifts that you get when you simply don't deserve it? Aren't those the most meaningful to you? He says, I want to give you something that you can't buy that you can't earn, it is completely free for you. And that's why we need to lead people toward this true picture of God. It's the true picture of how we should see God. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourself, it is the gift of God. Not by works so that no one can boast. Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. Did you get it this morning? I hope you did. This is a tough topic. This is an important one for us today. And can I just say that if you follow these steps, it'll make it a lot simpler. The truth about sharing our faith is that we put far too much responsibility on ourselves to save the person when the reality is it's not up to us to save them. It's up to us to be obedient, to share our story, to share our faith with them, and then God and the Holy Spirit will work out the rest. Let that boulder on your shoulder go. Don't carry that around. He doesn't call us to save. He calls us to witness, to tell our story. But so many people get that wrong. So many people hesitate. They stop. They say, oh my goodness, I've got to save this person. No, no. Nor do you have to clean them up either. You tell them your story. You connect with them, share your story, and then invite them to a place where they can experience Jesus. And listen, I'm not even saying that place is here. It can be at your small group. 
It can be in your home. It can be over dinner. Invite them to a place where they can experience God. He'll do the hard work. Guarantee it. Bow your heads and close your eyes if you would, please.